To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, visit gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. If you've been following along with these videos, you know we've been collecting new programming tools left and right. And with each new skill, we're even better equipped to write code that helps us tackle even more complicated challenges. So we could take our current Java skills and work on a totally new problem, but it can also be really satisfying to revisit an old project and see how far we've come. It's like running a 5K after you've trained for a marathon. Two things I would never do. However, let's take another look at our simple program we built from scratch a few episodes ago and build on it to solve even trickier questions about radioactive mice. I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, code and programming for beginners. Previously on the radioactive mouse dilemma, when a radioactive substance gets spewed into the environment, like after a nuclear power plant failure, it can wreak havoc on the lives of unsuspecting wildlife, including plenty of mice. The good news is that unstable atoms like uranium-235 decay over time. So eventually, the radioactive material in their bodies and their poop will drop down to a safe level. The bad news is that it takes around 700 million years for just one gram of uranium-235 to decay to half a gram. So even relatively small amounts of this stuff can stick around for a while, to say the least. Definitely way more than a mouse's lifetime. We managed to calculate all of that with some basic Java expressions and a scanner, which we used to collect input from a user. Now with four more videos of tools in our toolkit, including methods and if-else statements, we can build on this program to make it even more useful for our spicy little guys. Our initial program allowed us to calculate the radioactive decay of uranium-235, which was great, but only useful in very specific circumstances. So first, let's modify that code so that we can calculate the decay of any radioactive material Material our mouse might run into, you know, in case it casually runs into some plutonium. With any program, it's helpful to break the problem down into smaller chunks, or subproblems, or lasagna layers, or whatever you want to call them, before we jump into any code. We'll start with an input, which is the data that gets put into our code. In this case, data about whatever radioactive material we're interested in. Then we'll process that data using expressions, and by declaring and assigning variables to store data where we need to. This is where we'll do some math. And finally, we get the output of the process using print functions, which gives us our final result. In this case, we'll want the computer to give us a message about how much time it takes for half the radioactive material to decay into a different isotope its half-life. To start, we will need to import the scanner from the standard library to collect user input. And this time, we'll also be using the math class because this calculation deals with logarithms. We can level up our code from last time by creating a method. This way, we can call back to this half-life calculation throughout the rest of our program as it continues to grow. So let's define a method and call it calculate half-life. Inside the parentheses of our method header, we need to include the variables that the method needs to do its work, which are called parameters. The only parameter this method needs is the decay constant of a specific radioactive material, which is a number physicists have already measured. To keep consistent with what we wrote before, let's name this variable lambda. And because we're working with decimals, we need to specify that lambda is a double-type variable. Within the method, we're going to calculate the half-life using the same formula from before, only now inside the math.log function, we don't need to take in different starting and safe masses of radioactive material. We can just use 0.5 because we just want to calculate the half-life every time. And to finish off our method, we needed to return the calculated value of the variable half-life. Now, our method can't do any calculations without some input from the user, so we can add the code that will print a line to the screen prompting us for the input data, which says enter the decay constant lambda of the material as a decimal. Remember, for really big or really small numbers in Java, like decay constants of radioactive materials, we can use scientific notation with something like e minus 10 after a number. Like our code from our our first episode on radioactivity, we can define a scanner which will read in the answer from the user, and then take the number the user inputs for lambda and assign its value to a double called, you guessed it, lambda. Okay, before we go any further, we'll want to make sure this method is working properly. So let's add a print statement that calls the calculate half-life method. We may or may not leave this line of code in the program going forward, depending on what we want it to do, but we can use it now as a checkpoint. To test our code, let's enter the decay constant of uranium-235 as our input, because we'd expect an output of that huge half-life we calculated before, around 700 million years. But when we try and run our code, 
Hmm. It looks like we have an error. This error message lets us know that there's a syntax error here and the code couldn't compile. Specifically, a missing semicolon in line 12. It's always a semicolon. So let's add that semicolon and try running the program again. And drum roll, please. Everything seems to be fine now. Cool, 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 cool. Whenever you're writing or modifying new code, it's way easier to debug when you have fewer things that could be broken. So it's helpful to build in these checkpoints every so often to catch these little errors as we go. A lesson I really need to internalize personally. Now we could pat ourselves on the back and end this video with our shiny new half-life method, but we haven't really addressed the, well, mouse in the room. Being able to calculate radioactive decay doesn't tell us how radioactive a mouse is or what danger it might pose to the environment. Now, because this isn't study hall nuclear physics, we're not going to get into all the math that goes into calculating radiation exposures. Instead, we'll focus on programming an answer to this question. If we know what dose of radiation a mouse was exposed to, how dangerous is that mouse? Before we dig into the code, let's start with another program outline. To start, we'll need input data about the radiation exposure. We'll measure those doses of radiation exposure in sieverts. And to simplify, let's say that the most critical exposure time for life or death is immediately after it eats something radioactive. Next, our code will process how that specific dose will affect a mouse. We can use if-else statements to lay out different ranges of radiation exposure from harmless to deadly. And we'll need an output telling us the fate of our mouse and the danger level of the whole radioactive situation. Now that we have a plan, we're ready to start programming. Once again, we'll start simple and add some code that will print a line asking for an input. Since we need the user to input information about radiation exposure, it says enter the radiation dose in sieverts that the mouse was exposed to. And then we'll need to store that value by assigning it to a double variable called exposure. Processing this information is where our trusty if and else statements come in, which lets us instruct the computer how to make decisions based on certain conditions. We're gonna play it a little fast and loose with the physics here, but we hope you understand that it's for a good cause. There are three possible outcomes we wanna to add to our code. We'll kick off this sequence with an if statement, capturing if the exposure value is less than or equal to 0.5 sieverts, which we've decided means that the mouse was exposed to a safe dose of radiation. Environmentally speaking, in our extra simplified world, this mouse will probably live a relatively normal life, or at least one where it doesn't leave radioactive poop all over the place. Second, we'll need an else if statement to capture if the exposure value is greater than 0.5, but less than four sieverts, which means that we are in the danger zone. The mouse was exposed to a non-lethal dose of radiation and can spread it by pooping or getting eaten. It's a radioactive menace, sort of like a comic book villain, instead of, you know, the cool radioactive like the Hulk or Spider-Man. And for the final condition, we'll use an else statement to capture when the exposure value is greater than four sieverts. This means that the mouse was exposed to a lethal amount of radiation and will die before it has a chance to run around and contaminate the environment. Rip in peace. Our code is looking good. I think. I always think it looks good until Java tells me everything that's broken. Anyway, it's time to run the program and see if there's anything to debug. To test our program, we'll wanna try inputting different radiation exposure values to test each branch of our if-else statements. It's especially important to test the boundaries, like if the dose was exactly 0.5 or exactly four sieverts, to make sure that the answer is what we expect. It's really easy to accidentally put a less than instead of a less than or equal to, or even miss an operator altogether. So we can keep that in mind if we get a straight up error message or unexpected results. But in this case, all looks good, a miracle. So there we go. Even though we took some liberties with physics, we used methods and if else statements to level up our program from just a few episodes ago. And we learned that by working on our code chunk by chunk or noodle by noodle, we can test for errors and debug along the way instead of having a mess at the end to puzzle through. If you're enjoying Study Hall Code and Programming for Beginners and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. Thanks for watching and see you next time.